Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this week's episode of Thursday's Theology. Uh, we are currently in a series called Summer with the Saints with our good friend Jake. Uh, last week, we studied St. Augustine of Hippo and kind of his foundational thinking of the Western Church and Western theology. Uh, and this week, we are going to be studying... Mary of Egypt. Mary of Egypt. So, uh, once again, this is Jake, our special guest star. And uh, Jake, tell us about Mary of Egypt. Uh, so Mary of Egypt, just to kind of start with, I, I like to present her along with Augustine because she's, uh, very often the arguments made of the saints are unrelatable, and I love to present them with Augustine and today Mary of Egypt because both of them, again, the wild, dissolute youth, and then conversion to holiness. So mm. uh, Mary of Egypt was, she lived, I believe, in the 5th century, 5th or 6th century, I believe. Uh, but she was a little spoiled rich girl from Egypt, and when she was 12 years old, she ran away from home uh, and went to Alexandria, where she became a prostitute. Mm -hmm. um, but as she would later herself describe, uh, she was so consumed by her lustful appetites that she wouldn't even charge her clients, and she oh, wow. supported herself by uh, spinning flax and begging on the streets. Huh. So she does this for about 18 years, and then she hears about this pilgrimage going to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. And she decides to go to get more clients in the holy in the holy city. So she buys passage on the ship by sleeping around with the various pilgrims. And she gets to Jerusalem. And I believe it's at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. She tries to enter the church, and she finds the doors are barred against her. Mm. And it's in that moment that her conversion happens, and she realizes what she's been doing with her life and just the weight of her sin and everything. Mm. And she turns, uh, she turns to God's mercy. And if I... Again, if I remember correctly, uh, she sees an icon of the Virgin Mary and the child Jesus, and she repents, she goes to confession, she's then able to go into the church, and she just decides, okay, I have to completely change my life now. Mm -hmm. And so she's still in Jerusalem, and she goes back to this icon to give thanks, and she hears a voice say, um, if you cross the Jordan there, you will find peace. So a few days later, I think it is, she goes with... She takes three loaves of bread, crosses the Jordan, and goes to live out her days as a hermit. Mm. And I forget the time span, but then a monk happens to find her in the desert years later, um, completely naked, and she relates to him her life story of this radical conversion she had. Mm. And I think it's the next day he brought her communion, and then she, <laughs> this, the story even says that she walked across the River Jordan, um, on the water, just like Christ. Yeah, you know, no and big deal. Casually. <laughs> and then uh, she asked that he return uh, a year from that day, because I believe it was Easter when this happened. And he comes back in a year and finds out that she actually died the night that he brought her communion. Mm. And again, legendary story, but uh, the story is that a lion came and uh, dug her uh, grave with him. Mm. But I... But I I especially like her story because, as again, as I, as I said earlier with Augustine, very relatable, especially in our hypersexualized culture mm. of uh, very often where chastity is looked at an ideal rather than as a possibility, mm. uh, being able to see how, you know, this woman who really, really was far from God was brought so, so, so close to him. Yeah. And she's she's very highly venerated in the Eastern Church. Like pretty much any Eastern Church you go into, you'll see an icon of her. Mm. And it's, it's interesting because as we've been talking about Augustine and Mary, mm -hmm. um, what comes to mind for me is just the, the story of the prodigal son. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and it's just, it, it's interesting to hear how, because I think one of the things we, <laughs> one of the biggest misnomers about the prodigal son is that it, the scripture talks about how he went and lived wildly in a foreign land. Right, right. And we're just like, oh, you know, he partied and stuff like that. But like that, I think it, we misunderstand the depth of his depravity when we just like, Oh, he lived a wild lifestyle. Like that, that insinuates that he, you know, was sleeping around that insinuates right. that he was drunk. It insinuates that, you know, he was gambling and doing all these things that were right. uh, feeding his own desires, you know? And I think that with Augustine and, and Mary of Egypt, we, we begin to see that it's, it, you know, the, the story of the prodigal son is lived out yeah. in, in a lot of people's lives. Yeah. You know? Yeah where you start so far from God and you have this, this moment of recognition of like, no, no, I need to come back. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Just, uh, it, it, to touch on something, something, uh, I personally really like is the, the tradition of Mary Magdalene being a reformed prostitute. 
Mm. I personally really like that, regardless if it's true or not, because it it wasn't it. I personally, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is true though. Yeah. Of I, I don't think that was an attempt to slur her in the slightest. I think that was the tradition. Again, whether or not it's true, was showing you can be the lowest of the low. Yeah. And be raised up to the highest of the high because, you know, she goes from being a prostitute to being the apostle of the apostles of yeah. relaying to relaying to them the news of the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind, too, because even if you look at the genealogy of Jesus in, in yeah. Matthew and Luke, yeah, yeah. you have women of, of not the best reputation <laughs> included. And I think that's that's um, purposely done because it, it shows us that Christ's lineage mm-hmm. was human. Exactly. You know? And exactly. it was it was filled with people who were not the the Tamar, most saintly. <laughs> Tamar, Rahab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so with Mary of Egypt, yeah. um something that stuck out to me in the story you just told us is the the chur- the doors of the church being barred. Mm-hmm. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Um was her intent to go into the church to worship? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit more. What What do you think her intent was? Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure she then admitted to it. it was Saint Zosimus who founded the church and to whom she uh, later related her life story. But she totally admits she was in Jerusalem to find people to sleep with. Mm-hmm. You know that was her intent going into that church. Yeah. Like, so her intent, uh, and it, it wasn't just like oh she went the doors were locked. It was like I think there was a procession going on and like mystically like supernaturally these doors were not opening to her. Mm. So, and that's what made her realize the gravity of what she was doing. Right. Because I think it's it's definitely a different story if you go up and, like, the church doors are locked versus <laughs> yeah. they're wide open and you oh, yeah. can't go in, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I think that, that um, that's such a powerful image because mm-hmm. you think about just how many people come into the church and have ill intentions for it, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's such a powerful thing to, to realize, like, even with Mary's intention, she was barred from entering a sacred space. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, But I think it's also important to, to recognize that's also where she found healing and reconciliation mm. was in that same place. It, yeah. It, the, the beautiful thing about it is it made her realize, you know, what she, what she was doing, what she was living. That's not what she was created for. And she was leading other people astray in that regard yeah but once she realized that and she had a change of heart arms were wide open and they are and the arms of the church were always wide open it yeah. was just like the barring of the door was the wake-up call she needed yeah and i mean again going back to the prodigal son story yeah. you have um that moment of realization when the prodigal son is yeah. in the foreign field longing to eat what the pigs eat he, yeah he realizes he has this realization like man even my father's servants are eating better than this yeah yeah you know? and um and I think it's it's important to to note here too that I think one of the key aspects of living a saintly life, for lack of a better phrase, mm-hmm. is a personal point of repentance. Yes, you know, because I think we often see saints as like, oh, well, they were born holy and you know, exactly. they were always holy. But no, I think it always has to do with a personal choice to pursue God. And and that's just not a one time thing. That's that that's a day day to day, moment by moment thing. Um. So, yeah, that's it's 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 not a one and done as it can very often seem to be. It's you know the same. They never gave up, and I'm certain, like Mary herself, when she went out to live in the desert, she had. Oh no, she she even says herself, like for 17 years, she had temptation to go back. Mm. You know the span for which she had done this, but then once that time had passed, once she had faced those temptations and not given into them, yeah, then she was able. And even at that point, she still had you know on a daily basis had to say yes to the Lord. Yeah. And that's a great point because I think that um, we often, another misconception of the saints is that once they had that conversion experience, their life was like perfectly holy. Oh, yeah. You know? And I think, you know, going back to last week when we talked about uh, Augustine, mm-hmm. um, I don't think his celibacy was easy. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, especially after the lifestyle he had lived. You exactly. Know? Um, and same thing with, with Mary of Egypt where it's not it's not easy to like flip a switch and just, you know, all no. of a sudden like, oh, I don't desire this anymore. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, I mean, and especially we see that today, especially with the mass epidemic of pornography addiction. Yeah. And yeah. but th- thankfully, what I see is uh, people who are helping men and women who've fallen into this of saying, 
it is an addiction. It's not something you can just yeah. turn off like that. Yeah. Like your brain has been wired in this, so you have to rewire it in, yeah. in a different way. Yeah. And that's a great point because I think that, um, that is, it, it's such an isolating thing where you, oh, where yeah. it's so, there's so much shame assigned to it. There's so yeah. much stigma assigned to it that if you're struggling with it, oftentimes you don't seek help because you're so ashamed. You exactly. Know? Um, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, as a ending note for, for Mary of Egypt, um, what is something from her life that has, uh, added to our understanding of, of sainthood or, mm. you know, what's, what's a takeaway yeah. from her life? I think the biggest thing is just the, the mercy of God in that regard of seeing how, you know, no, no sinner can fall too, too far. Mm. It's, mm. we, we are the ones who have to accept his love and mercy, which he's always extending out to us. I, yeah. I think that's the biggest message of her story of seeing how far she was. And yet again, as you kept mentioning with the prodigal son story of the father running yeah. to his child once, they yeah. came back. And that's a fantastic point to uh, to look at because I think one of the most egregious lies the enemy can whisper to us is, is that we've fallen too far. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And I think that's why studying the lives of the saints is so important because like with, we've seen with Augustine and, and um, Mary yeah. that they were pretty far away from God. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that we need to really, really look at is no matter how far you fall, um, God is always going to pursue you. Yep. You know? So. Yep. Great. Well, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so thanks again for joining us this week for this uh, week's episode of Thursday's Theology. Uh, we're going to continue on next week with another Life of the Saint. So do you want to give a spoiler alert of which one we're going to get into next? Uh, my personal patroness, Teresa Lisu herself. Nice. Okay. So we're going to get a, um, a look into her life and, uh, yeah, hear what Jake has to say about uh, her next week. But thanks again for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeff. This is Thursday's Theology. And remember, theology doesn't always have to be difficult. It is simply the study of who God is. Take care. We'll see you next week.